Welcome everyone to today's very special music cast episode featuring an instrument that we have all seen before but hasn't had a music cast performance all of its own, the Theorbo. My name is TJ Dalton, I'm a classical guitarist, a lutenist, a historical plucked instrumentalist, and a Theorbist. Oh, and I just so happen to be the community project director for Twin Forest Music Civic. The Theorbo was conceptualized by the Italians in order to accompany the voice in the recitative sections of opera. The Theorbo's main job in that role was accompaniment, and to the Italians they felt that the Theorbo was the perfect accompaniment to the voice. Through its history, the Theorbo traveled all over Europe, and each country developed its own style of playing, technique, and made the, really made the Theorbo their own. So today, in today's performance, we are going to look at four heavy hitters in the Theorbo world. Two from Italy and two from France. The two Italian composers that will be featured in today's performance include Hieronymus Capsberger and Alessandro Piccinini. Both men were instrumental in the development of Theorbo technique and the really creation of repertoire for the instrument. On the French side we are going to look at Charles Hiorello and Robert de Vizet which further took the idea of the Theorbo and elevated its status into really beautiful solo music. Uh, most of the time in the form of the French suite. So taking dance movements and writing solo pieces in the spirit of them and combining them all into one suite. Today's performance is by no means a whole survey of the Theorbo literature. There are plenty of other composers that I have not mentioned today, but with today's performance, it should give you a pretty decent idea of how the Theorbo was played back in the Baroque era. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today, and again, I really hope you enjoy this instrument as much as I do, both playing and listening, and enjoy the performance. I'm going to pass the mic and camera off to my counterpart musicians, and they will tell you a little bit more about this wonderful instrument. Enjoy! Hey everybody, my name is Paul Morton. I'm here in Strasburg, Pennsylvania, in my sister's art studio. I'm in exile from New York City. Um, and I just want to share a bit of music with you today. I'll be playing a prelude and an alamon by the 17th century lute composer Charles Aurel. Um, I'm going to be playing a theorbo, which, as you can see, a theorbo is a type of lute. It's uh, the largest member of the lute family and it was originally crafted and invented in Italy and Florence and Venice for the beginnings of what we would learn to call opera in the early 1600s. So it's about 75 years later, it had, the Theorbo had proliferated <laughs> its way through Europe and um, made, made it to the courts of, um, of France in the King Louis. And Charles Aurel was a court composer there and a court lutenist and he composed really beautiful, very calm music, which is something I think we could all use a bit of today. <laughs> so thank you so much for Natalie Kress uh, for putting this together, uh, Music Civic Baroque. And um, so here's a prelude in Alamon by Charles Aurel.
is Adam Cockerham coming to you from New York City. I'm going to play today a set by Capsberger, um, a 17th century composer uh, published in Rome. Uh, I'll play three pieces a toccata, a pasacaglia, and a bergamasca. Uh, Capsberger was known to have written lots of music, dance music, songs, music for arch lute, songs with Baroque guitar accompaniment, but he is most famous for writing for this instrument, which is the Theorbo. Get a whole thing in the shot there. Keep coming. Yeah, there it is. So this Theorbo has 14 strings, 14 courses, all made of gut. And uh, what's particular about this instrument is, of course, the size. Uh, people often ask why it's so large, and the reason for that is the string technology of the time only allowed you to get a string that was so thick before it stopped speaking. So the only, only way to get a low note is to either have a thicker string or a longer string because they couldn't make strings thicker and they hadn't really developed this uh, way of wrapping strings in metal to make them denser. Uh, what their solution was was to increase the length. That way I have a full bass range So that's my lowest note, the 14th string is a G. Capsberger was actually known to have played a 19 string Theorbo. He was, apparently had humongous hands. He's kind of the list of the Theorbo. Uh, the other peculiar thing about this, other than size, is this tuning. Um, it's just like a lute in that it's tuned in fourths, uh, except for the top two strings are down an octave from what you would expect. And that's really a practical reason so that the strings wouldn't break at such a large length. Uh, but composers like Capsberger utilize this and will write this type of figuration where a string will go across many different, uh, excuse me, a scale will go across many different strings. Uh, and it creates this kind of over ringing effect, kind of like a harp. Um, So uh, these three pieces, Tricata, number two, uh, Pasakaya, and Bergamasca by Capsberger.
Today I'm going to play for you three pieces from Alessandro Piccinini's 1623 publication for Lute and the Orbo. I'll start with Toccata No. 5, go on to Tenore Dato il Mercatello, and finish with its paired Corrente. The Tenore refers to a set of harmonic progressions over which Piccinini writes divisions or ornaments. The Corrente takes the same harmonic progression and turns it into a different type of dance. You can tell from Piccinini's writing, the fact that he's writing a toccata, that he is a Baroque composer, but from his part writing, you really hear uh, his Renaissance training. The, the counterpoint he uses is much more strict and not quite as fantastic or florid as some of his compatriots in Rome. Enjoy.
Hi, Josh here. I wanted to um, take a moment to tell you a little bit about my instrument. This is the Theorbo, and it is uh, the largest of the lute family. Um, so it might look a little bit like a guitar, and you can play it a little bit like a guitar, but it actually um, has some significant differences. Uh, it has a round back instead of a flat back. You can see it has these ribs. Uh, it has frets like the guitar, but um, at this point they were actually tied on, uh, so I can move them around, which can be good or bad. <laughs> and it has quite a few more strings. Um, now most instruments in the lute family have uh, double strings, or we call them courses, uh, which means that you play, like a 12 string guitar, you play two strings um, at once for every note. Um, the theorbo is kind of unique in the family in, in that it sometimes is played single strong, and this one happens to be single strong. So there's um, 15 strings, uh, and the, the bottom, eight are just like a scale. So it goes from the note G, low G, all the way down to a very low G. Um, it's even a flat, very low G. And uh, then I actually have this one bonus string, F sharp, a major seventh above that, just for fun in case. Um, and then the, uh, the strings above that, six strings above that here on the, uh, the fingerboard where I can fret, um, they go from A to A. So it's kind of like um, what you would think of a normal guitar, if you're familiar with that. Except, uh, you know, a little bit higher, a fourth higher, so it's um, kind of a guitar with a capo on the fourth, on the fifth fret. And um, they're tuned very similarly to what you would expect in a guitar, a bunch of fourths with a third in there somewhere. Uh, except there's one um, surprise in that the uh, two highest strings are actually an octave lower than you would expect. So if I play them from low to high here, it sounds like this. which can be very confusing um, as you're learning the instrument, but eventually becomes a real asset. Uh, it helps to give the theorbo some of its uh, characteristic resonance. So the piece I'm going to play for you next is by Robert de Vizet, who was a um, lutenist, composer, gambist, guitarist, uh, living in France, working in the court of Louis XIV, and then later on Louis XV. Uh, he published a lot of music, but this piece actually doesn't come to us from um, in this form from the publications, but instead we have it in manuscript, a really beautiful manuscript by um, a local uh, politician who also played lute as an amateur and he made this uh, beautiful copy for us. The suite is um, in C minor, which is a very dark and painful key, I think uh, probably for the listener, but also for the performer. And uh, the title of the second movement might give us a clue as to why. The second movement is an allemande, which is titled uh, as, as a tombeau to Mademoiselle de Vizet, or a eulogy to the late wife of de Vizet. I hope you find it as beautiful as I do.
Thank you everyone for joining us for today's very special Solo Theorbo MusiCast performance. I hope this clarifies what the Theorbo sounds like, functions, where it came from, and basically what the instrument is. It can be very tricky to distinguish the instrument in an ensemble setting because in retrospect, it's not the loudest instrument in the world. And in a larger setting against a cello, a violin, and a harpsichord, sometimes the sound does get lost, especially in a live setting. Thankfully, with this move to digital media at the moment, we are able to highlight and enhance the natural sound of the theorbo. So I hope this episode brought some clarification to what the instrument really sounds like. And I hope it inspires you to go out and explore and learn more about the theorbo and dive deeper into some more Theorbo music. Thank you.